uh, uh, authored an op-ed piece that okay. I saw. Hey, and, and great having you with us. I, you authored an op-ed piece uh, that I saw over at Common Dreams titled, The Fed Will Be to Blame If the Economy Crashes Into a Recession. And uh, you noted that the Fed has uh, created a crash, essentially, uh, by in, in, in the process of ending the vast majority of economic expansions that have taken place in the U.S. since World War II. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, that's actually an interesting story. I'm glad you asked about it uh, because, you know, the famous, the famous economist, the macroeconomist at uh, MIT, and in 1998, he wrote an essay about this. Uh, he was one of the most prominent macroeconomists in the country at that time. And he said that um, there had been at that time nine economic expansions since World War uh, II, mm. that is the growth part of the business cycle. And he said not one of them uh, died of old age. Everyone was murdered uh, by the Federal Reserve. And he went on to say it was their raising interest rates like Paul is doing now. Mm. And that's really true if you look at the data. They said they'd trigger all of those recessions. Now, it so happens in, in 2000, uh, uh, we had a different cause, which was the stock market bubble burst, right? And right. then after that, we had the Great Recession. That was the real estate bubble. And then we had COVID. So we've had three that were not uh, a result of the Fed actually causing it. But now we're going back to normal. Right. <laughs> because we don't have a bubble big enough to, you know, or a, a pandemic that's going to actually push the economy into recession. So, you know, Larry Summers and, and Joe Manchin and others are running around telling people that uh, the economy's too hot, unemployment's too low, we need to, uh, you know, there's too much government spending, quack, 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 we need to back off all this stuff. Um, and uh, you, you note in your article the difference between even 6% unemployment and the 3.6% we have today is more than 3.9 million jobs. I mean, the, the human misery of millions and millions and millions of Americans losing their jobs is not an inconsequential thing. I, I, you would think that, that if the Fed is thinking of throwing millions of people out of work, they would have to balance that against some argument that this is like absolutely critical for the survival of the economy and the country. And, and it appears that they're making the case that that balancing consideration is the damage that inflation does to an economy. And yet you point out that both the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, and the Federal Reserve itself are predicting, uh, respectively, for 2023, the IMF is predicting 3% inflation worldwide. Uh, or at least among the developed nations, and the Fed is is projecting 2.6 percent. So how, how do they for the U.S. Yeah, for the U.S. For the U.S. Right. So how do they how do they square the fact that they're predicting that this the essentially that this inflation is going to be episodic, meaning it was really caused by the pandemic or the rebound from the pandemic, much like after World War II we had an inflation in 46, 47. Um, uh, or even arguably the high oil prices we had the inflation in the 70s. Um, how, can, how can they square the fact that they're basically in their predictions saying this is going to be episodic, but in their policy they're treating it as if it's baked in? Yeah, that's a really good uh, point. I'm glad you brought it up because, you know, the, the organizations of economists that, uh, and you know, the IMF has about 1,000 times our budget, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, these are people who put a lot of resources into projecting inflation. And these are, the, you know, it wasn't, it was the IMF. I used the Organization for Economic and Co uh, Cooperation and Development, and then also the Federal Reserve itself. And yeah, they're not projecting, uh, they're projecting that this inflation is going to come down pretty fast and uh, next year. And it's going to come down to a very reasonable level. You know, the Fed's target is 2%. Right. Uh, but that, you know, no economist would be upset about 2.6, for example, or even three if it's not going to stay, it's not going to keep going up. So how do they do it? I mean, you know, they basically uh, try to say that the inflation is going to get out of control. It's going to get so bad that it's, you know, it, it, it causes a worse uh, crisis. Like in the and then, 70s. Of course, they always say, yeah, and then they'll say, well, 
you know, and when it gets like that, they're going to have to cause an even deeper recession, which, of course, is not always true either as the second part of the argument. But we're not even – see, the, the, the argument breaks down before that. <laughs> the mm. argument breaks down because – uh, there's no self-reinforcing process that you can see that would cause this inflation to uh, continually grow or become persistently uh, higher because you don't have, for example, a wage price spiral like you had in the 70s where, you know, the prices go up, workers demand and can get because they had unions and contracts with cost of living allowances. You know the prices go up, and then they can, you know then they can get higher. Uh, they demand higher wages, and they get them. That pushes the prices up higher, and this keeps going. So that would be the first self-reinforcing process that these economists would say is going to happen. But then you look at what's going on right now, and in fact, uh, the rate of growth of wages is actually falling. So it can't hmm. be pushing prices, right? If it's not getting higher. So, it, it, you know, at the last few months of the last year, it was uh, annualized uh, 6%. Now it's 4 And so how can you say that that's pushing the inflation higher? And, you know, the other thing, I mean, I can go into the other theory they have if you want for how you can get a self-reinforcing process, and that's expectations. So if you can get – if the expectations of markets or people changes uh, drastically and permanently, then – that can cause inflation to keep going up, where inflation goes up and expectations rise, and then inflation keeps going up. The same kind of, again, a self-reinforcing uh, process. But you don't have that going on either. You know, you have a, a measure that economists look at. It's called the five-year uh, break-even rate. It's looking at the bond market, and it measures the expectations that bondholders have uh, for inflation. That's been about 26 uh, since the beginning of July, it was about the same as it was a year ago. So you don't have either of these two stories that could give you uh, inflation. And that kind of makes sense, because where's most of the inflation coming from? It's not coming from here. It's coming from, you know, gasoline rose 59% over the last year. What's that from? That's a war in Ukraine. Uh, right. You want to talk about maybe trying to you know, negotiate an end to well, there's that. Also that, that there's also that 2.7 uh, million barrel a day production cut that Donald Trump, uh, the, Jared Kushner, negotiated with the Saudis uh, in, in 2020 when the price of oil was crashing and you had oil producers down in Texas starting to go bankrupt to try to support the price of oil. And the Saudis have not raised production back up by that two and a half, a little more than two and a half million barrels a day. They have not yet raised it back up. In fact, there's a piece in the Financial Times yesterday, I believe, um, talking about how the Russians, you know, there's this OPEC meeting coming up, and, and the Russians are saying, do not raise production. And, and, the, and after Joe Biden went over and begged them to, they, have, they still haven't done it yet. And that seems to be driving inflation a lot. Well, that would help. I mean, sure. that would help drive inflation. But I think that just the war itself is contributing sure. uh, and uh, to both inflation, mostly gasoline, but also food prices. And then you have, of course, the adjustments uh, from the pandemic, the supply cuts and uh, supply chain problems in China. There are external causes. And that brings us to another point here, which you probably would have raised, and that is that most of the inflation we're getting, and again, it's the vast majority of the increase in inflation that we've seen, is causes that are really external and they're not uh, going to be influenced uh, by the Fed. They're not going to be moved. Is it possible the Fed, that there's uh, that, the, that the Fed has some sort of secondary agenda? There again, I, uh, a piece that I read in, in uh, I'm pretty sure the Financial Times said that historically there's a spread between um, how much banks pay in interest to people with savings deposit accounts and what the Fed fund rate is. In other words, the rate at which the Fed can can borrow money. And or the banks can borrow money, and that that rate that that spread between the two has just gone to hell recently. That the banks are are now able to charge a whole lot more interest on credit cards and on mortgages, and yet they're not paying more on savings accounts. And people have moved a lot of money into savings accounts because the stock market has scared them recently. Um, you know, I, I, I know my bank is still paying less than one, one tenth of one percent. Uh, I, I understand American Express has some high interest savings accounts that are 
at 1%. I mean, you know, it's still, or 1.25 is still relatively meaningless in this environment. Um, could it be that the Fed is jacking up interest rates just to increase bank profits? Because that was the summary of this article, was that bank profits are going through the roof as a result of this. Yes. Well, I agree with you completely, and I've noticed this in the past. There is an asymmetry that when uh, the interest, you know, the federal funds rate is very low, for example, the interest rates uh, charged uh, by uh, say credit cards doesn't go down uh, that fast but it moves very fast uh, uh, you know in the other direction the differential right. uh, between that can change and and so yeah you do have that problem but i don't know i don't believe the fed's doing it for that reason the fed i mean powell himself for example i mean I, i'll be honest about it. he he said chair uh, that we've ever had, you know, really uh, since the Fed. W yeah, I think I'm, I'm so, kind of cynical. The guy was a Republican. <laughs> I've been thinking, yeah, that, but it's why kind it of odd, isn't it? I mean, you know, Bernanke is a Republican too, but yeah. he was the first one to do uh, quantitative e easing in uh, 2009, and that was a big step. So uh, why forward. why and, then is is Powell raising interest rates? Well, you know. This is something that, you know, you know me and, and Seeper, I'm kind of conservative about saying, uh, speculating on what people are really thinking. I know, understand. Can, and, and good know. reason, yeah. But if you want my guess, I would say it's kind of pressure from the institution itself right. and from, from other powerful forces, which typically pressure the Fed. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I, I, I think that, that makes a lot of he sense. himself has shown more commitment to full employment than any Fed chair that I could name. That's fascinating. So I'm hoping he'll get better. But yeah, <laughs> yeah it's still wrong. Too. And you can see in my home for yeah. Market Watch. There you go. Uh, that I, I mentioned him. Mark, I got to run. But thank you so much. Mark Weisbrod.